Jana Cardiff and uh, George Burrs Miller are two Canadian artists that really have had a substantial career internationally as well as, as, as nationally. We've been uh, collaborating as artists for quite a long time, um, pretty much ever since we met and we've been married a long time too, so our whole life is really a collaboration. We produce works that are like hybrids between theatre, music and the visual arts. It's very different to approach their work than it is to look at a painting. In, in that traditional sense. And it's even very different from going in and looking at a video installation and sitting and, and watching. There are many different physical attributes, sound that's uh, sculpted in this space. And there is this sort of sense of proximity to, to these objects that, that are equivalent to you. So you're in real time, real space, and things start to happen. Kitty Scott, my uh, colleague on this exhibition and, and the curator at the Art Gallery of Ontario, came up with this idea of Lost in the Memory Palace as a way to think about the exhibition. The sort of sense of memories, that evocation of uh, something that's pulled, extracted out of, out of a past is, is something that's really uh, fundamental to their work. So we created a space really that is a series of passages where you move from one space, one moment, one experience to another experience, uh, that sense of disorientation, which is part of uh, certainly the uh, impact and experience of their work. I think the room concept for us is, uh, is about containment. It's like that with Doctor Who box, right? What's oh yeah, called? yeah, totally. The it's TARDIS. Like the TARDIS. So like the TARDIS contains so much more than it actually can contain, and that's hopefully what our work is like. That it's just this small room, but it contains a whole world inside of it. The Dark Pool is the earliest work in the show. It's from 1995. And it was for them the moment when they realized that they could build a space very consciously and entered in through the door, and it was the possibility of anything could happen in that space. Uh, you're looking, you're listening, so the story unfolds in these sort of fragments and moments. You're sort of shifting and encountering things. It's a very dynamic sort of space, but one that you move through very, in a sense, very quietly at the same time. As a starting point for a body of work, it is an extraordinary moment and it really sets the stage for, for what's to come. There's a little lake that George's family used to go to when you were a kid, right? Yeah. Called Muriel Lake. Muriel Lake, yeah. So we went there and we took our camera gear. And we love the idea of transporting people into this theater, which we made a hyper-perspective model. So it creates this illusion of space. And we wanted it binaural because um, binaural means basically listening with two ears, but it creates a three-dimensional picture for you. Did you see that creature? You're getting the audio from a big cinema or theater, but you're looking at this model, but it's a hyper-perspective model, so it's also doing something weird to your eyes because it's playing with your, the way we, we assume perspective should work and it's not doing what it should do. So you're manipulating this whole sense of reality and there's a real moment where you can really feel like you're actually in the cinema. There was a carousel of slides that George's grandfather had taken. And we thought, oh, we could somehow can work with this. As part of the process, we knew we might want to record our voice with it. And I'd put it in the wrong order, because I wasn't thinking that that was important. And then George got concerned about, well, it's out of order. And then we started fighting about that. And the conversation in Road Trip is basically that conversation. Well, do you want to reorder them right now? I guess so. It's a lot of work. Just, uh, yeah, go back. It's a story of George's grandfather, but it's also the story of Janet and George's collaboration. We always like that there's a component of our work that is us, that's, re that's real. You know, things happen, and then they end up in the work or they don't. Sometimes 
I mean, we take a lot out, we peel away, but then sometimes, yeah, we go totally broke. Opera for a small room is a, I think, a, maybe lies at the center of their practice. It's a room that has some of the theatricality that is uh, so much as sort of repeated again and again in their work. You stand at the front of it if you want, or perhaps you go around to the side and, 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 and peek in. And you look into this space uh, that is filled uh, with record players and records. And occasionally you see the shadow that flits across the room as if that person was still, still present. You hear uh, his voice, uh, story is told. It's also a great opera with all the tragedy and uh, drama that you, one might hope from a great uh, theatrical piece. Storm Room's a, a different piece, actually, for, for Janet and George. It's one that I've always liked. It's a very poetic piece. You walk into this, this room, you can see the outside of it, it's rough and tumble, it's a stage set. And then you walk up the ramp and into the room, and you're somewhere else entirely. It's this beauty of watching a storm come up and it gets darker. I love the idea that you can fabricate it with you know, lights and water and, and illusion. And people are aware that it's illusion, but it still affects them. Killing Machine is a, one of those works that is both kind of horrifying and absolutely attractive at the same time. It starts with a button, but you have to make the decision to press the button, and you realize the consequence of that is, in this instance, quite dramatic. The work speaks to violence that we enact on each other, and it's the decision. It still is the decision that, that, that we make. Uh, it's a powerful piece. It's a, very much a piece about the contemporary condition, but it's a condition that also resonates throughout history. The work F-sharp minor was one that was produced for the exhibition. You can come to the realization that you can play the table. You can move through that space, and as you move through it, you're triggering the sounds that speak to a certain kind of emotion and, and obviously evoke a certain kind of emotion. It can be incredibly uh, cacophonous in that space, or you can, if the room is quiet and, or if people have stepped back, you can really play in that room and I think compose both as you move physically, but also orally. In many ways, the story that Janet and George tell in their work is a story that's you know, been repeated again and again. It's a story about relationships. It's a story about the mysteries of, of life, those things that perhaps emerge in a dream. This is very much a part of their work. So when you hear Janet's voice speaking in the back of your head, or you're, you have this sort of evocative image that you know, comes uh, really forward, that's the quality and the character of their work. And I think that that experience is something that we've, we, we look for in art and we, we want to have uh, in art. I think that their work offers that opportunity in a rich, complex, dynamic form that is so unusual and so successful that it really makes them an important uh, part of the artistic milieu today.